Thank you for joining us for Hot Topics. What is a Christian's role in our current culture? This series was first presented at Southland Church in Greenwood, Indiana, and includes three guest speakers over eight lessons who led us in discussions around culturally relevant topics that Christians encounter in their daily lives and helps unpack how the Bible leads us to respond to those questions. In our fifth conversation, Josh Hirschberger led a discussion of sexual identity. Josh Hirschberger is the founder of the Good Citizen Project, an organization that equips church leaders and other committed Christians to be gospel-centered citizens that transform communities, states, and their nation through the power of the gospel. Josh is an ordained minister, attorney, author, and the host of the Good Citizen Podcast. Well, it is great to be here with you this evening. As uh, Pastor mentioned, I am both a minister and an attorney, so people often ask me how I can serve God and the devil all at the same time. I know I I do appreciate your pastor. I appreciate uh, this church, and it is a great honor to be here this evening. So when I started my practice, I I essentially hung a shingle. Not I got shingles. I hung a shingle, which is kind of a phrase in the law. And as part of that, I was representing a company that built agricultural pole pole barns out in the country. Um, Part of my job was go out there, kind of take a look at the site, make sure there were not any legal issues. So I pull up to the site one day, and I see uh, over here a husband, and he has a hammer in his hand. It looks like he's driving stakes into the ground to kind of outline this building. That all seemed normal. But then I looked over here, and close to the house was this woman who appeared to be the man's wife. And she was holding a handgun. And the handgun was pointed straight at her husband. So it's one of those moments in life, I don't know if this ever happened to you, kind of time slowed down. And I'm I'm sitting like, all right, number one, um, you know, he's he's got this hammer, he's been threatening her, I need to go do something about this. You know, possibility number two, she's done. Like, she's over this, it doesn't matter if she's taking care of business in the middle of the day with witnesses around, she's done (laughs) with this marriage. And the third option was like, well, I'm just going to slowly back up here and go down the road and hopefully, you know, nobody sees me. All right, about that time, the wife notices I'm in the driveway, she gets red in the face and she throws the gun on the ground and she runs inside. And the, the husband sees me and he comes jogging over to the car and comes up and like taps on the window you know, slowly, like, <laughs> rolling the window down with the whole, like, the customer's always right smile on my face, right? And uh, he's like, sir, sir, it's, it's not what it seems to be. I'm like, oh, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> and he begins to explain, he's like, look, I've got to get this building within 12 inches of grade. And to do that, I needed a laser and only had one. And it was on the end of my pistol. <laughs> so what could possibly go wrong? You know, a very you know, level building, but also very difficult explanation to a judge and jury. Your Honor, I was just pointing the business end of the pistol at him to get the, bu- the building within grade. Um, so I, th- I think everything was all right, and they worked out their, their differences. But that day taught me something important. Lasers are, are really powerful tools. They can help you, you know, level a building, defend your family, and they are oh so much fun if you have a cat. But we should also be circumspect about how we use a laser because things could go terribly wrong if we're not careful. When I think of that story, I think of the concept of human identity, how we define ourselves, how we think of ourselves, the story that we tell about ourselves internally, and just how powerful that concept is. That if properly focused, if focused through God's word, It can be a powerful tool that drives us with purpose and meaning each day of our lives, but also can be co-opted by our society, by falsehood. And so tonight I want to talk to you about an identity crisis. And here's the big idea. The sexual revolution is transforming American moral norms concerning family and sexuality at breathtaking speed. I'm sure this is not a surprise to anyone. And it's impacting our communities, our schools, even our homes and hearts. So how should committed Christians navigate the cultural issues raised by the sexual revolution and especially the LGBTQ movement? Well, here's how. Tonight, I wanted to dive into kind of three things that I try to do in any presentation. A little bit of just cultural analysis, but then also what does Scripture say, and then just some practical tools, some practical thoughts on how we can apply these biblical principles well. My hope is to, to leave some time towards the end for about 10 minutes of questions, So I'm going to cover a lot of ground tonight, but if you have a question, kind of jot that down. Hopefully we'll have a chance to get to it towards the end. Before I jump into any of that, though, I wanted to address kind of two things. The first one being, all right, 
out of all of the issues that we could be talking about, why are we talking about this one? And a commonly asked question if I'm talking about this, this topic is, well, why aren't we talking about other sexual sins? Why aren't we talking about poverty and other needs in our community? And one of the main reasons that I speak on this topic is, let's say someone came up here and pointed the finger at me and said, Josh stole this iPad. They said, look, that was my iPad. Josh stole the iPad. And I just stood here, and they kept saying, Josh stole the iPad. And I said nothing in response. What would you assume? Now, certainly we have a right to be silent in the United States, but what would you assume if somebody accused me, somebody you knew and trusted accused you time and time again, uh, accused me of stealing the iPad, and I said absolutely nothing in response? What would you assume? You would, you would assume I am guilty. And so I did not start this conversation. The issue of sexuality, of transgenderism, is in the news. It's on cereal boxes. It's on Disney Channel. Constantly, time and time and time again, telling us that what the Bible says about these topics is archaic or even worse, hateful. And if the church is constantly silent on the topic, it leaves those in this generation, certainly those in any generation, wondering, does what the Bible, is what the Bible says true and is it good? And so we're talking about it tonight, not because this is the only thing we have to say, but because culture, time and time again, throws this at the church as an example of why the Bible is not true or it is not good. Also, why wouldn't I be speaking about this topic to you? Uh, For whatever reason, um, over the last five to six years, uh, this has been a part of my ministry. It began back in 2017 when I was asked by the Kentucky Bar Association to participate in a diversity and inclusion summit. I spoke from a Christian viewpoint alongside a gay activist and a transgender activist. And through that experience, I was able to kind of share my speech, but was, what was much more meaningful was I had an opportunity to have lunch or coffee with both of those individuals, hear their stories, begin to hear their arguments, their concerns with biblical Christianity. And ever since then, I've been asked to present on these topics in public life. I've also attempted to build relationships with those that disagree with us. And so that's a little bit of the background. Why are we talking about this? And then why am I specifically talking about it? As we move into this concept, I think there's kind of three things that we need to keep in mind. What is the cultural moment? How exactly should we conceive of our particular cultural moment in relation to these topics? So a couple of quick things. If you have a handout, I've left a blank there that you can take a look at. The first one is that we are experiencing what I might term a freedom fight. All right, if I had to boil down Everything that's going on in culture into just kind of one idea, it would be the fact that we are experiencing a freedom fight. The United States was built on something called ordered liberty. It was the general idea that we flourish when we embrace who God has created us to be. So we're free to build a society, to build a life according to God's good design. Right? That was the definition. That was the idea of freedom. But now in our society, the definition of freedom has changed. And so it's not so much a a freedom to build a society according to God's design or to build a life according to God's good design. It's more a freedom from. So whereas originally freedom was an ordered liberty, now I might say it is an open license in the sense that we don't believe in God. And the, the truth is here inside of me. And I get to determine that. And I get to decide what's best for me and best for my society. And the general idea of freedom in our society today is that we're free and we flourish when we can choose our own path. Can you see how this, these two views of freedom are slamming headlong into each other? We're talking about the sexual revolution. What is, and I, I generally try to, what I would say, steel man an argument, not make a straw man, but say, if, if someone was describing the sexual revolution today, just very objectively, what's at the very core of it? I get to define my own sexuality. Thank you very much. No one gets to tell me There are rules. I get to define that for myself. Is that not what we hear all of the time? Well, which view of freedom is that? Is it the ordered liberty, a biblical view of freedom? Or is it an open license? The idea that there is no God and I get to define my own way. And so can we see in in some of the most hot-button issues of our day, those are symptoms of this underlying clash between these two views of freedom. One being a biblical view, the other one being a secular view. 
The next thing that I, I, I might mention is playing into this is that we now live in a digital babble. Pastor mentioned um, that I lead the Church Ambassador Network. We're working to build relationships between pastors, governing officials, uh, to pour into their lives, mentor them, disciple them, encourage them, and then partner with them for the common good. We're also working to equip Christians to be gospel-centered citizens, and that's what brings me here tonight. So I mentioned that, we're again, we're living in this digital babble. Now, I love technology. I'm so glad that we live today, maybe not 150 years ago, all right? Uh, it's great. Um, I, one of my bucket list items is to go to space. It's just to cool about 250 grand at the moment, all right? Um, if you followed SpaceX, this is one of their newest rockets. Uh, what I was fascinated by, uh, by this SpaceX Dragon capsule, here's a picture of the capsule, is that on the inside, you'll see that there is a joystick in the middle. But that joystick is only for emergencies. That entire StarCraft is guided with the touchscreen. So we're literally going to the stars using our fingers. And I don't know about you, but my iPad has crashed before. I'm not sure how confident I would be <laughs> of, of flying this into outer space. Uh, but, but there it is. Also, if you uh, saw this driving down the road, you probably should assume that the Martians have invaded and like run for the hills, all right? But actually, that is an autonomous pizza delivery vehicle. Uh, these are active in some major cities across the United States. It's essentially a pizza delivery robot. Now, let's pause for just a moment to celebrate our civilizational attainment, okay? Like, we haven't solved poverty, we haven't cured cancer, but we can have a robot deliver a pizza to your house. Like, ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived, okay? So here's, here's the idea behind digital babble, is that in a sense, our technology is always better. Even if you go now to get a new phone, isn't your phone always better than the last one? Or is it now a flip phone? It's always better, right? And essentially what's happened is just conceptually, we think that we have engineered our way around a need, our need for God. The scientist that helped start the technological revolution, it was said that they were thinking God's thoughts after him. But now God is an afterthought, isn't he? that we don't need God because we can define ourselves and then any of the problems that occur because we're rubbing up against the grain of the universe, we'll just figure it out. And so aren't we in, in a sense, a digital babble where we don't, no longer think we need God? The last one I'd mention is that the sexual revolution has moved from an acceptance phase to what I might call an enforcement phase. Right here in this, the city of Indianapolis, in Brownsburg, there's a teacher who just said, in good conscience, I can't affirm a child according to their transgender ideology using cross-gender pronouns and names. I just want to be able to use their last name as an accommodation. And he was asked to resign, eventually terminated. That's been litigated all the way up to the Seventh Circuit, and it is an active case. I'll share maybe one or two more examples, but I don't think I have to go too deeply into this. Probably in your workplace, among your family, it's going beyond the, well, hey, it's you know, you need to accept this, you need to come along. No, no, you must celebrate this, or your job may be in jeopardy. I may cut off a relationship. And so I don't celebrate these things. I try to speak on these topics as objectively as I can. I think that we can all recognize that this revolution has moved from, hey, you should accept it, to now you must accept it, or there could be consequences. With, with such a, a large topic, um, it's, there's so much we could talk about tonight. What I want to do tonight is really kind of break it down into a few pieces. And I have realized as I'm out in the public square, speaking to Christians, that oftentimes even Christians don't quite know what the Bible says about these topics. Now, many of you that have studied the Bible longer than me, I don't, I don't mean to offend you in, in that sense, but that it applied to this particular cultural moment. I will admit to you, I've been in church most of my life. My dad was a pastor, specifically like the theology of the body. Up to a few years ago, I had never really deeply studied what the Bible says about this. So I'm not here to give you my opinion. Rather, I want to tell you what God has to say about these issues, and then we can wrestle with practically how do we work that out. So let's move into spiritual formation. what I might call the Christian sexual ethic or the biblical sexual ethic essentially comprises three topics. The first one is marriage. The second one is sexuality. 
And the third one is sex slash gender because those terms are defined differently now. So let's dive into this. You'll see there kind of the first bullet point. I believe that the Imago Dei is the foundational biblical principle for responding to the sexual revolution. Now, I know we have at least one other attorney in the room, maybe more, and I think lawyers figured out a long time ago that if you use Latin, you sound smarter, and also maybe you get to bill more. I don't know. Okay. But uh, Imago Dei means that we're created in the image of God. Each person that has ever been born was created in the image of God. And so this idea is foundational to responding to the sexual revolution as we'll go through. So I want to try to boil things down, just pretty brief definitions, probably not a surprise to anyone, but it's important that we can explain these things. The first one, all right, marriage. What, what does the Bible say about marriage? Very simply, God created marriage to be a lifelong, exclusive union between a man and a woman. This was set out in Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 24, but then was reaffirmed by Jesus when he was speaking in Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 5. It's very interesting in this passage Jesus is asked a question by the Pharisees referring to the book of Deuteronomy. But Jesus looks back further than Deuteronomy, goes all the way back to the created order, and says that marriage was between a man and a woman. He says, you have known, and he says that marriage is between a man and a woman. You can look up the passage there. And so what do we do with this? I have been troubled slash fascinated um, perhaps more trouble than fascinated, as we have had an opportunity to build relationships with governing officials. We consider our efforts nonpartisan in the sense that when a pastor steps into the state house, they do so as a representative of Christ's kingdom. So over the last couple of years, we've had over 300 meetings. Those are with Democrats, independents, Republicans. We often ask them a question. What, in your opinion, is the worst problem in your district? So we have 150 uh, representatives, so that'd be representatives and senators in the state of Indiana from all over the place, urban, rural. I would say 85 to 90 percent of those representatives, without prompting, said the same thing. In using the same phrase, I asked them, What's the worst problem? They responded, The breakdown of the family. The breakdown of the family. So I'd say the breakdown of the family is one of the key problems facing our society. Matthew 19, 5, again, Jesus says, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they, they twain shall be one flesh. They two shall be one flesh. And so Jesus says, he reconfirms the created order, that one of the three key institutions created by God, family, church, state, was defined as, one, as between a man and a woman. Now, whenever I speak about this, I do want to point out, I, I know a number of heroic single parents out there. I know of kids that have lost a parent to, to an early death. And so what we're talking about here tonight is not necessarily an individual story. People are resilient. They overcome all sorts of things. But as I've had conversations with those heroic single moms specifically. They've told me, I wish that that dad was still in the picture and that he was who God had created him to be. And tonight we're talking about society-wide. Our society-wide, what is best for human society? And it is for marriage be between a man and a woman. And that is what God set up. There's a, an interesting book called Them Before Us. And the author is a, actually a former pastor's wife, now an international advocate for children named Katie Faust. And I, I want to give you some, some thoughts here tonight, some things I'm wrestling with as I think about how not just American society, but many, many Western societies around the world have just dispensed with, all right, well, marriage just isn't that important. It doesn't really matter. Well, who suffers when a, a society says marriage doesn't matter? The children. And Katie Faust makes an interesting point, and she, does, she advocates for this all around the world. She says, most of our marriage laws all around the world are based on the needs or desires of adults and not the needs of children. And she made this statement, which was kind of a drop the mic. I know this, she says it in a way that's meant to catch her attention, but just, I, I think the idea is important. But she said this, if sex is God, then children are the sacrifice. I'll say that again. If sex is God, then children are the sacrifice. If our society puts sex on such a pedestal and the desires and needs of adults are always prioritized, then children who do best when they have a mom and a dad, again, that's not always possible in a situation. But society-wide, we know that that's best statistically. Then our society has said marriage doesn't matter. 
And let me ask you this question. What grade would you give American society when it comes to dating and marriage? And I don't think we have to go much further, right? The, the broken relationships, the pain, the, the relational shrapnel that comes from just, again, if, if God's design, the way he created it at the beginning, is good and best for us, then it makes sense if we ignore it, refuse to call it what it is and it's good and important, then what would we expect to happen? It's certain, we don't celebrate that as Christians. We lament it. And may we be the example of saying this matters. So the first one is that marriage matters. Our society says, not a big deal. Aren't we past that? But Scripture, not my opinion, Scripture says marriage is between a man and a woman. The, the latest development in this space is actually polygamy um, or polyamory. Uh, polygamy is kind of one older man with younger women. Polyamory is literally any number of people that want to be in a committed relationship with one another. Uh, there's already been a court in New York State that upheld this as marriage. And, and so essentially, in our, there was an argument back in 2015 before the same-sex decision, marriage decision came down that if you pull it away from the, the man-woman definition, that there's no logical argument against something like uh, polyamorous relationships and so I think that that is something that we're beginning to see. Um, someone gave me a copy of Men's Health uh, for Christmas. You know, it's one of those gifts. I'm like, well, thanks. <laughs> and I, Men's Health is generally about having better biceps or something. But there was a, an entire article in there about how to practice, here's the, the, the phrase, ethical non-monogamy. All right, so this is, this is reaching uh, cultural saturation at this point as well. So that's the first one, marriage. The second topic that comes up in this discussion of course, is sexuality or sex. And we know from Scripture that God created sexual intimacy to be expressed between a married man and woman. Now, I will be as discreet as I can in this section, but just the, the nature of this conversation, I may have to say a few things, uh, but I will be discreet as I can. The first thought here is that Scripture speaks broadly to all people. And that when, when Jesus says, and when the Bible says, to, to look on a woman, even to look on a woman, is to lust after her. And that sexual intimacy is to be expressed only between a man and a woman. That this cuts against all people. And that we have to decide to follow Jesus. That we have to put our desires aside, the lust that may be natural to us, and say, no, I'm going to follow the way of Jesus. So this affects all of us. Certainly there is a pornography epidemic which is something different entirely. And if the statistics are true, something like 75 to 80 percent, maybe more men being addicted to pornography in our society, this is also impacting a large number of women. That even in a group this size, that there may be somebody struggling here uh, to say, all right, I want to be true to my vows. And I don't want to be addicted uh, to something that wasn't even available, say, three to four decades ago. But this is especially impacting young people. And so when scripture says sexual intimacy is to be expressed between a married man and woman, this is a standard that applies to all of us. And most, if not all people, struggle to follow the way of Jesus because we are sinful. As Pastor was talking about this morning, that all of us fall short of God's standard in, in this area in some way. Of course, the, the hot topic that comes up in, in this particular issue or particular areas. I, I don't know many people that would say, no, looking at pornography is good and it's healthy for you or healthy for a marriage to be objectifying women. I, I don't hear that argument. Nor do I hear the argument that, no, fornication or adultery, no, that, that's actually good. So the argument that often comes up, of course, is homosexuality, sexual relations between uh, two, two women or two, two men. And... What I found fascinating as of late is with what I might term the curious rise of the religious left. That for many years in the public square, what we would hear is, well, those people that believe the Bible, you know, they're out of step, it's archaic, it's even hateful. But the newest argument that I'm hearing are actually from people that describe themselves as progressive Christians that would say, actually, the Bible condones this behavior. 
there's a fairly famous uh, account on TikTok, I think the name is Pastor Adam, where he has these just one-minute clips where he'll go through different biblical passages and say, no, here's actually why the Bible condones this, and the Bible's actually for this. It actually supports this lifestyle. And again, tonight, what we're doing is we're looking at Scripture. What does the Bible say? Not so much what do I think, but what does the Bible say about this issue? I, I don't have time to do a long review of the six key biblical passages having to do with this issue, but I'll, I'll give you just some broad strokes on our podcast, the Good Citizen Podcast, if you Google what does the Bible say about homosexuality, um, on the Good Citizen Podcast, it'll pop up. Uh, we're two different episodes where we went through this at length. Uh, so just briefly, Genesis chapter number 19 and Jude 7 are kind of together. This is the story of Sodom. The general argument uh, from more progressive uh, readers of Scripture is that the sin of Sodom was actually in hospitality. It, it was not homosexuality. But a reading of these passages, also a verse in Ezekiel that refers uh, to Sodom, it is clear that it, it certainly was in hospitality, but it was also in hospitality of, of the worst sort, in the sense that there was an attempted gang rape. And that there was, and again, I'm, I'm trying to be discreet, but this is what Scripture says. And that there certainly was, a, in, in Scripture, a statement that homosexuality was wrong. In Leviticus 18 and, and in 20, you may be familiar with these passages. There's a, a very clear prohibition of sexual intimacy between men, uh, between two men, two women. Now, what is often said, and again, I'm trying to boil down a lot of arguments here, but is often said about these particular verses as well. You know, you say that the Bible condemns homosexuality, but it also very close to that says you, you can't have uh, mixed fabrics in your clothing or you can't eat shrimp. And the clear thing, clear, or the, the key thing to understand with these passages is the difference between the ceremonial and the moral law. Sure, today, as, as a believer, I think I have the freedom to eat pepperoni or, or shrimp, but I don't have the freedom to go murder someone, all right? And, and so there's, there's some, some key uh, studies that you have to do there. So, right, what's the moral law? What's the ceremonial law? So certainly in Leviticus 18 and 20, there are clear prohibitions against homosexual uh, behavior. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and in 1 Timothy 1.10, Paul lists homosexuality in lists of sexual sins, very clearly sets them out. And what's interesting is he uses a Greek word that essentially he coins a Greek word and refers to them as male betters, all right, and essentially someone that takes a male to bed. And he's using that language from Leviticus. And so he's directly linking that behavior back to Leviticus saying, look, here's, here's what scripture says about this issue. And... There's an argument that the language in 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy 1 is referring more to exploitative sexual activity, uh, such as slavery or rape, and certainly that is prohibited by those passages, but there's also broader language saying, look, any activity of this sort is against God's design. And of course, Romans chapter number 1 is a very clear statement. He, Paul's saying, look, there are some that have refused God's natural order, that have refused God's creation. And he uses specifically the example of homosexuality in Romans chapter number 1. Now, there are scholars that will argue Paul knew nothing of kind of loving, committed relationships. But remember that Scripture speaks very clearly that marriage is between a man and a woman and that any sexual activity outside of that man-woman marriage was prohibited by Scripture. Uh, so many of those in the, the more progressive readers of Scripture will simply say, well, Paul didn't understand psychology. He didn't understand what we now know about sexual orientation. And as believers, we have to always be careful when we're trying to conform Scripture to moral norms or cultural norms. And so I know that was a lot of information, but I just want to prep you a little bit. As you begin to study this issue, if you feel led to go further, um, those are, are some of the ways that more progressive readers of Scripture talk about it. For me, I come back to Mark chapter number 7 and verse 21 because it is often said, well, Jesus said nothing about homosexuality. But in Mark chapter number 7 and verse number 21, Jesus condemned, and the Greek word is porneia. You can hear the root word of pornography in that particular definition. And that would be a broader term that his audience would have clearly understood to prohibit a variety of illicit sexual practices, including adultery, fornication, prostitution, and homosexuality. Pull all of that together. 
I think just a very plain, clear reading of Scripture says, marriage is between man and woman, and God created sexual intimacy to be expressed between a married man and woman, period. Now, this is something that, of course, is very controversial in our society. And there have been readers of the New Testament that try all of these different arguments to try to say, no, no, it's okay, but a simple reading of Scripture brings us back to these truths. And all of us have to wrestle with what the Bible says. I have a, a good friend that God's using in an incredible way. And a few years, had a chance to meet him, uh, was getting to know him a little bit better. And I, I grew up in a, a more conservative background, and so I had, had not had a lot of these conversations yet. So I was talking to individuals, trying to figure out these topics. What, what should a faithful Christian do? And my friend, as we were getting to know each other, he shared with me one day. And I appreciated his candor. And he kind of told me his spiritual journey. He said, look, Josh, I have wrestled with same-sex attraction my entire life. And when I, I came to Christ, when I came into a relationship with Jesus, I sat down one day, and I really wrestled through the Scriptures. And he did basically what we just did, a review, an overview of what Scripture says about the issue. He came to the conclusion, no, the Bible speaks clearly and plainly. And he said, Josh, that day I had to decide, Am I going to follow my desires, or am I going to follow Jesus? And he said, I've decided to follow Christ. And I thought that was a, a beautiful example of Scripture calls us all to self-denial, fulfilling and living out the way of Jesus. There's an interesting article by Michael Gannon, and it, it's termed Against Heterosexuality. It's, Michael is actually a, a Catholic scholar, and he brings up some interesting, important, uh, but also sad history in that the idea of, of sexual orientation or of being gay was actually created by the church to, in a sense, stigmatize people that wrestled with this particular sexual sin, to say that it was some sort of kind of super sin or, or that it, was, it had a greater ick factor than the rest of the, the sexual sins. And that it was that idea brought on by the church that actually backfired and now culture says, well, if this is who I am, then why can't I express myself this way? And this points us to a really important biblical principle. And that is that Scripture calls all of us to deny ourselves. That the kind of the core of discipleship is denying ourselves. It says in First Timothy that we are to flee youthful lust, to flee fleshly lusts. And that God will help all of us as we wrestle with these issues, to follow Jesus. I love what's, what, how Paul concludes in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. He says, In such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So as we reach out to other people, hear me clearly. I, I've told you I, I believe Scripture speaks very clearly on these topics, but it also gives us a heavy dose of humility, in a sense that we ourselves fall short of the standard that God has set for us. And as we minister to other people, I had a chance to talk with the youth pastor here for just a few minutes, that because this is such a hot-button topic in our culture, when we meet somebody, especially a family member, that, that may be wrestling with these issues, maybe identifies as homosexual or as transgender, it's very easy, like the first thing that we talk to them about is this. But actually, the first thing that we should point them to is a relationship with Jesus. A few years ago, my former law partner and I had a chance to be in relationship with a lady who was really wrestling. She was, at the time, in a same-sex relationship. At that time, marriage, had, the Bergefell case had not come down. Same-sex marriage had not become a legal devel development in the U.S. And Again, this was kind of new to me. I'm still trying to wade into this, understand, figure out what Scripture would call us to do. And my law partner at the time, even though this was a huge part of the discussion at that time, simply asked this woman to come to church with him twice. And I love this lady, as she describes it, uh, the second time that she came to church, uh, she, she describes coming to Christ. And she says, look, you know, Josh, it was not pretty. There was snot everywhere. But I realized I was a sinner and Jesus saved me. And I came to Jesus. And she was on fire for the Lord. And after 
a period of time, uh, that relationship ended. She began seeking out relationships uh, with men. But if, if my friend and former law partner had led with, here's your problem, do you think they would have ever gotten to Jesus? But by leading with all of our problems in this world is that we need Jesus Christ. And that we all fall short of biblical standards in this area. And that we need Christ's help. Now, it doesn't mean you avoid the conversation. But it is that you lead with what is the point? Who are we pointing people to? It is not our expectations. It is to Jesus Christ himself. And to following scripture. So, of course, this is a hot-button topic. But I believe those are some principles that we should remember and apply. The next one, of course, that has come up often in discussions as of late has to do with transgenderism. Um, The word sex is generally considered your biological sex. You're born male or female. Uh, Gender uh, these days is considered to be much more fluid. I think maybe the cereal box uh, does uh, a decent job of explaining this. No matter of who you are, who you love, or what pronouns you use, you're too awesome to fit into a box. All right, so I'm sure you're aware of just how culturally prevalent this idea is. And so what does the Bible say? The Bible says that God created each of us as male or female as an expression of his image and nature. Now it's interesting, this this concept of the fact we are created in the image of God, it gets thrown around in our society a good bit. But what's interesting, in the very same verse that God sets out, we are created in his image. Every person is created in his image. That is the very same verse that sets out our maleness and our femaleness. Here it is in Genesis 5, 1 and 2. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. So I find this beautiful. There is something about our maleness and our femaleness, not separately, but together, that reflects the image and nature of God. That is what Scripture says. So a couple of quick things to think about. I mentioned to you I had not studied kind of the theology of the body, what the Bible says about the body. But when I did, I found it absolutely beautiful. So what are a couple of things that we need to know about our bodies? First, our bodies are intentional. That God created us as intentionally as male or female. I love Psalm 139. You may remember these verses. I'll praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. My soul knows right well. My substance was not hid from you when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect. And in your book, listen to this, all my members, my body parts, were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So from the foundation of the world, God knew us. And in our mother's womb, God intentionally fashioned us down to our chromosomes, down to our body parts. And he intentionally created us who we are, as male or female. And so the the going idea that you're in the wrong body, that your body doesn't matter, is not biblical. What the Bible says is that we were intentionally created as embodied beings, And that being male or female is a part of his plan for us. So on one hand, it is, you're a cosmic hiccup, right? A bunch of moon dust. And out of millions of years, somehow you came to be and there's no real purpose. And the fact that you're in a male body or female body has absolutely no no bearing on your life. It could be a huge mistake. The universe is cruel. What scripture says is, no, no, no. You're intentionally created as male or female, and a loving God knit you together in your mother's womb. The next thing is that our body is essential. That we are created as both body and soul. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says this. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God, I'm pausing for effect, in your body 
and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, transgenderism is kind of a form of new Gnosticism. If you are familiar with Gnosticism in the first century, it was essentially a belief that physical things don't matter. Only spiritual things matter. And that your physical body has no particular purpose. What Scripture says is that your, your body is, you're created as both body and soul. And that your body isn't just a part of you, but your body is you. That we're called to glorify God, not just in our spirit, not just in our spiritual part, our heart, or, or whatever it is inside of us that we're supposed to follow these days, right? But no, not just your spiritual part, but your physical part. You're supposed to glorify God in your body. The last thing is that our bodies are eternal. Are eternal. Romans 8, it says, Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We believe as Christians that one day we will get a glorified body in eternity. So God's eternal plan for you includes your body. So to kind of put these back to back, culture says that your body is like a canvas for self-expression. It's, it's like an iPhone case. You know, bedazzle that thing, make it black, make it blue, whatever you want to do, it's yours. It's a canvas for self-expression. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so just kind of wearing that a little bit, and what are we telling the next generation? That again, you're a cosmic hiccup, there's no purpose, and if you feel like this is an accident, then you can just change it. Versus... You were created by a loving God. In eternity past, he knew you. And he knit you together in your mother's womb. And he has a specific plan and purpose for you. And it includes your body. And it includes the fact that you are male or female. God knew that and he planned that. I find that beautiful. The last question, as we kind of close this review of the Christian sexual ethic, and again, I said I wanted to focus on that today, is are we confident that what the Bible teaches is both true and good? And not just good for us, but good enough that we would go out into a culture that doesn't believe it and say, no, this is still true and this is still good. So let's dive next into some internal decisions. And I'm speaking here specifically about family decisions, about church decisions. And so how, how should we go about dealing with family members or, or people in our church, even maybe people in our workplace that come to us and say, look, I am in a committed homosexual relationship. I'm transgender. Like, how, how do we deal with this? The first thing that I would mention to you is the difference between a question and a quarrel. A question and a quarrel. In my experience, many students... Uh, even many people these days are pulling information from everywhere. And isn't that the problem, right? Information everywhere. There's no real authority. Who do we trust anymore? And so the difference between a question and a quarrel. Sometimes in a, a ministry uh, or even in a family, there can be kind of this knee-jerk reaction if somebody says this because of just the cultural um, issues around this, the, the angst, the, the controversy. And so there can be kind of this knee-jerk reaction. Well, I think it's important to ask the question, well, is this... Is this a question? Is this somebody that is searching, that's trying to determine what's good and what's right? And then the quarrel is somebody that wants to pick a fight, all right? And they're out there. They're fully promoting this. They think that you're a terrible person because you believe the Bible. So can you see how answering a questioner like they are quarreling with you could have a very bad effect on a situation? And so trying to determine what is this situation and how should we respond I was able a few years ago to have Heather Scriba on our podcast. Um, Heather went to college. Uh, she became part of the LGBTQ community there, fully uh, socially and physically transitioned. And in her own words, uh, if you understand this, this community, when, when someone has top surgery, that it's, it's almost like a sacrament. Or it's, there's an un- unveiling, and it is like you are now the true you. All right, so it has really great significance. And these are, again, Heather's words, not mine. You can, you can look up the podcast and listen to it. But she just said, but at this reveal, when again, she's supposed to be her true self, 
she said she looks in the mirror, she looks at her friends, and she said she realized that she had made a soul level change, or a skin level change, a skin level change that did not solve her soul level angst. She made a skin level change that did not solve her soul level angst. And it was a sermon about the fact that she was not just God's child, but God's daughter that brought her back into relationship. She now lives as Heather um, and is telling her story. And I asked Heather, all right, say there's a family member that comes uh, to me, or, or there's a, a student in youth group or a student at Christian school that comes to a teacher or comes to a parent and says, I believe that I'm gay. I believe that I'm transgender. What would your advice be? Because understand, those that are on social media, those that are, are putting out information about this, they train young people to expect when you make this pronouncement that you're going to receive hostility and pushback and hatred. And if you do, you're playing right into the playbook. Well, here's what's going to happen and here's what you need to do. And so Heather's advice was your f- the first thing out of your mouth is to say, no that we unconditionally love you and that this is not going to change that love. We love you and we want you to hear that. We want you to know that. And then the next question is what do you mean by that? Because there's so much information and everybody's story is different, right? When you say that, what do you mean by that? How did you arrive at this conclusion? What are the events? Was it your, your peer group? Um, was it something that you, you read online? Was it a friend? What, how did you come to this conclusion? And then how, how do you know that that's the solution for you? How do you know that this is going to make things better? And one apologist I had on the podcast, he, he said something I thought was profound. Sometimes you can't answer people's questions, but you can question their answers. How do you know that? Help me to understand And so by opening the door to conversation, you allow that relationship to continue. I say here that the church is a key partner with parents to address uh, questions concerning sexuality. That if the church, as a youth group, and I was able to meet the youth pastor here, just really blessed by a brief conversation with him, that maybe sometimes students, maybe at home, they're, they're a little nervous about asking that question. But maybe they'll ask that question in youth group. And so the, the church, and they may come to, to one of you, if, if not a grandparent, maybe it's just somebody they've come to trust in the church, and they feel like, hey, I can go ask this really deep question. We need to be ready for those kinds of questions. Because of how much is being thrown at the next generation, we need to be ready to answer telling them, look, we love you. Help me understand what you're saying. Now, that does not mean you don't bring biblical truth to bear. But I imagine if you're in this type of conversation, most of the time, the students know what you believe already. And so you can bring that truth in as you can, but it's important to begin that conversation with those particular questions. I came across uh, this book, and as I've, I've talked with others, I so appreciate these kind of three things. So it, when it comes to a church, when it comes to a family, are we teaching with clarity? Are we showing compassion? Are we creating community? Rosaria Butterfield, you may know, uh, was an activist. Uh, she actually began to study the church to try to disprove Christianity. And then she had about 200 meals with a Christian pastor. And it was Christian community that, that showed her the truth and the beauty of the gospel. And then she came to a relationship with Jesus, is now a, a pastor's wife, and she wrote the book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. I wanted to come to this story as a church, as you think through this, and I'll, I'll be outside, There's, there are other things I can talk about with kind of developments in the treatment of gender dysphoria and why I believe that Christians saying, look, what we, what we believe in this particular area is that God created you to be male or female. And if you follow what's called the Dutch approach, many times that, that particular gender dysphoria, that angst will often fall away. Or that there are other issues going on. And so not rushing to judgment um, to treat a child with affirmation is important. But I I came across a story a few years ago about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he was a a pastor in Germany uh, that that tried to save kind of the confessing church, to kick Nazi Germany or Nazism out of the, the mainstream church in Germany, but he failed. 
And and please understand, I'm not comparing our current culture to Nazi Germany, full stop, all right? I'm not doing that. But what I am saying is that in in the Germany that Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew, there were very deep formational forces going on. An entire, Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany convinced an entire generation of young people to go to war. And so there were these really deep formational forces coming against an entire generation. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer went out and he started a seminary in a place called Finkenwald. And one of his friends named Niesel uh, was, was concerned about him. Like, why, why did you do this? And in such an important moment, why are you starting a seminary? And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer asked him to come out uh, to Finkenwald. He got there. Dietrich Bonhoeffer asked him to, to get into a rowboat. He rowed him across this uh, stream. They went up on a hill overlooking a Nazi airbase. And Bonhoeffer began to point out the, the Nazi squadrons landing and taking off, uh, the, the soldiers marching in lockstep. And, and he said this. He said, the, these Germans were, were in training for a kingdom of hardness and cruelty. He said it would be necessary to propose a superior discipline if the Nazis were be to, to be defeated. He said, you have to be stronger than these tormentors that you find everywhere today. And the author of the book, it's called Beautiful Resistance, he summed it up this way. He said this. What he was doing in Finkenwald, what Bonhoeffer, the Christian pastor, was doing in Finkenwald, had to be stronger than what Hitler or what the culture was doing in his army. He said, discipleship must be stronger than cultural formation. Loyalty must be stronger than compromise. And I love this last thought. He said this. This, meaning the church. He said, this must be stronger than that. Isn't that the word for the church today? As we face uncertain time, as we face so much cultural pressure coming against us, coming against our kids and our grandkids, we have to form a community. We have to have a discipline, a, dis- a discipleship, a brotherly and sisterly love that comes around people, no matter where they are in these struggles, and say, we love you. Do life with us. And this must be stronger than what culture offers. I always try to kind of ground down, grind down what I say into just one phrase or thought. And to pull all of this together, I started with the thought of identity, human identity. Is not what we are facing today an identity crisis. It's actually in the terms, right? Sexual identity, gender identity. You define yourself according to these things. And even beyond that, we're tempted to define ourselves according to our good looks, our wealth, where we were born, all of these things. But what is Scripture pointing us to? Scripture is is not saying these aren't important. These aren't critical things to wrestle with and to think through. So we're not maybe less than those things, but what Scripture is saying is that we're more than those things. Who are we? We are unconditionally loved, uniquely skilled, eternally significant children of God. And with that in mind, don't be a victim of identity theft. What does the enemy want to do? The enemy wants to say, no, 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 no. You're not a child of God. You're not who God made you to be. No, you get to find yourself. And that's what's going to bring you happiness. But it's a lie. We flourish And this is the word of Christianity to our culture. Our culture doesn't hear it necessarily, but all we can do is keep saying what is true and trying to show them that we flourish when we embrace who God created us to be. That's our identity. May God give us the strength and the wisdom to do this. Before we jump into Q&A, let's take a brief word, a time to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you tonight. God, I just lift this presentation up to you. I know I don't always have the words. How how can I describe your beautiful created order? That you designed these things. You gave us these beautiful things. And you told us, here, here's how you use it. And that's what's going to lead to joy and life. And if you ignore it, it's going to lead to destruction and death. So God, I pray for this body of believers. Thank you for these Christians that would come out and study what does your word have to say about a critical topic. God, we don't have the wisdom to navigate our times. 
We don't have the courage. We don't have the strength to stand up to the forces that are coming against our generation, against young people. God, we know you do. So God, please give us the courage. Maybe even more importantly, give us the wisdom to know when to ask this question, when to ask that question. Yeah, we know that wisdom is from above, and we ask for that tonight. Thank you for this body of believers that is dedicated to your word in this space. May you help us as we go out and attempt to influence our families and our community. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We may have just a few minutes uh, for a couple of questions. So there's some water for you, Josh. You. I'm sure you could use that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just ask one question. You, you mentioned tonight we're so grateful for the way you approached how to address an individual and make sure you keep the topic on the real topic because homosexuality or transgenderism is simply one of thousands of symptoms of people who are in rebellion against God. So it's just one of them. And so let's talk first about a relationship with Jesus. But what about the macro? You know, what, what should we be expecting of ourselves in terms of influencing the culture at large, for instance, government or legislation, as it relates to the issues of homosexuality or transgenderism. Yeah, and so you'll, you'll see on your, your page, there's a bullet point here. All people are made in the image of God and should be treated with equal dignity and respect. But disagreement is not disrespect, and conformity of belief should not be the price of citizenship. So how do you love someone well? You tell them the truth. You do it with grace, but you tell them the truth. The same is true in our culture. And as we're at the State House, there are a number of bills. I'm, I'm litigating a case right now in which parents had their own child pulled from their custody because they could not in good conscience affirm his transgender ideology. I, I mentioned this is going from the acceptance phase to the enforcement phase. Uh, as I've, I've led tonight with how do we minister well, but also in our broader culture, in your sphere of influence, you have to stand up for these things. Because if we don't, people don't hear the truth. All they hear are the crickets when they're su we're supposed to be the conscience of our culture. And so trying to figure out with wisdom, how do you do that well in your workplace? How do you do that well in the public square? But we do need to speak up and just be rock solid on the belief, look, we are created as male or female. Marriage matters. And it doesn't matter if it takes 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. Being faithful to those principles, we believe in the end, will make a difference in society. Um, so practically, in your workplace is probably where this is going to affect a lot of you. But if you're asked to put preferred pronouns in an email, is that going along? And I think every Christian's going, going to have to wrestle with their own conscience. But I cannot in good conscience do anything that affirms or condones the idea that you can be anything but your biological sex. And by the way, you should have the right to do so. And in fact, there was a Supreme Court case that came down just last week that said a, a wedding designer, a wedding website designer, has the right to say, I'm, I'm not, I will serve all people, but I'm not going to create a message that goes against my conscience. And so the courts are stepping up to help Christians and other, other people of faith and of conscience to say, I can't in good conscience do that. So maybe it's just a small thing. You say, how am I going to make a difference in my workplace? Or how am I going to make a difference in broader culture? Well, God has placed all of us in a sphere of influence. And if, if you will stand up, maybe it encourages your coworker to do so. And that encourages your boss to do so. That encourages your company to do so. And so all we can do is, is speak the truth with love where we're called. But I just I want to encourage you. What the Bible says is true and good. So let's be confident in that. And just ask for wisdom as you're navigating that in your sphere of influence. Thanks for joining us for this installment of Hot Topics. If something you have heard has sparked more questions and you'd like to continue this conversation, please let us know. You can find ways to connect in the description below.